Hello, hello. And hi, hi, hi. And welcome to another edition of Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly Beatles talk show podcast where we talk about anything we feel like where the Beatles are concerned. Their music, their history, the group years, the solo years, what's going on in the news, anything that we feel like talking about. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. And I do hope that you know me for my syndicated uh, Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing, currently on 50 radio stations. Along with that, I also co-host another Beatles talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And that show is just what the title says. It's all about the solo careers of the Beatles. And in addition to that, I have my own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which is loaded with Beatles content All conversations on the Beatles, interviewing musicians, historians, podcasters, DJs, you name it. And I'm being joined, we should see the face eventually for one of those co-hosts that I have here. I'm being joined by Darren Darren DeVivo, who wanted to show off his t-shirt, and proudly, since the, the show that we're doing this time is for George Harrison's Living in the Material World album which is about to celebrate its 50th anniversary. You know, Darren, for 40 years on the radio in New York City at New York's WFUV, their resident Beatle expert, and a great co-host to share this program with. Hi, Darren. Hello, everyone. How are you? Hi, Ken. Hi, Alan. Great to be with you again. Okay. And Alan Cozen's with us. You know him for writing several books on the Beatles, and one, the current one, on Paul McCartney, The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, with Adrian Sinclair, goes practically on a day-by-day basis of what was going on in Paul's life towards the end of the Beatles, through the end of 1973. Also the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and um, got that something, how the Beatles, I want, I want to hold your hand, changed everything. Hello, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, Darren. Hello, everyone. Hello. As I said just a few moments ago, uh, we're doing a special show right now for Living in the Material World. I've been saying on both my podcast shows, this year is the year of anniversaries, the 50th anniversaries of so many things. We just did a show on the Red and Blue collections from the Beatles. Prior to that, we had Denny Sywell as a special guest for the 50th anniversary of the Wings album, Red Rose Speedway. May 30th actually marks the 50th anniversary of the release of Living in the Material World. And then later on in the year, we also have Mind Games and Ringo and Ben on the Run. (laughs) And also the single for Live and Let Die. We'll squeeze that in there as well. Tremendous year it was 50 years ago for Beatle fans. And uh, I certainly haven't hidden my feelings about Living in the Material World. It's my favorite album of all time from any artist and we're all going to share our feelings about that album as uh we approach 50 years on for living in the material world but before we do that we have the latest beetle news to get to ringo Starr kicked off his spring 2023 tour last friday night at perchanga resort and casino in temecula california this is with the same band he's had the last several years including steve lukather edgar winter Colin Hay, Hamish Stewart, Greg Bissonette, and Warren Hamm. The set set list looks to be the same from his previous tour. The spring tour runs through June 17th. Don't forget Ringo will follow that up with a fall U.S. tour, September 17th through October 13th. And all the dates are listed on Ringo's website, ringostar.com. But the big news that Ringo revealed in a few interviews and his press conference, is that he is planning three, yes, three new EPs, one of which is already done. The second he's currently working on with Linda Perry, who's already written two songs for Ringo from his previous EPs, and Linda will also be producing the new EP for Ringo. And Ringo said that for that EP with Linda Perry, he's just singing and playing drums on that one. And there will be a third one, which will be an all country EP. The idea for that started with T-Bone Burnett, who sent him, according to Ringo, 
one of the most beautiful country tracks I've heard in a long time. And he called it very old school country. But he won't be working on the country EP until after the tours are finished. At his press conference, Ringo continued to say, as he said many times, that what he's doing is living his dream, playing music with other great musicians. He said he was in the greatest band of his time, and he loves to tour. When asked how he can do so many dates close to each other, he actually said he prefers that. He doesn't want to be stuck in a hotel for three days in between with nothing to do. And he feels that with the band he has right now, they could play every day. All the band members were there at this press conference, all saying what a thrill it is to be in this band. And for certain members like Steve Lukather and Colin Hay, the big thrill for them is when they play the other members' music other than their own. The band all agreed that they don't try to just do a carbon copy of the songs as they first came out. They all add something to make them their own arrangement. So, Ringo embarking on two tours with the exciting news of three EPs that we'll be getting. Let's hope we'll hear some news about the first one soon. So, it could be that we'll get two EPs this year and maybe the third next year, or depending upon when he finishes that last EP, if we're lucky, maybe three EPs all in one year. Who knows? You know, it'll be interesting that two of them are going to be produced by other people because everything Ringo's been doing lately, he's been producing with, you know, with, uh, with, uh, Bruce Sugar. uh, Bruce Sugar's help. Uh, But now he's going to be T-Bone Burnett. If Hmm. you've listened to anything that T-Bone Burnett's produced, He's worked, I mean, he's worked, I, I don't have to run down the list. It includes Robert Plant and, you know, I mean, he puts his fingerprints all over uh, um, um, the artists, almost to a fault, I feel like sometimes. But I'd be very curious to see what he does with Ringo in the country setting. And and Linda Perry could really put some teeth on, you know, some some new Ringo music, which would be very interesting to hear, so... That's very cool. One thing that I think I, because I haven't watched it yet, I have a recording of the press conference, uh, but I did read that Ringo said no uh, no 50th anniversary, anniversary reissue of the Ringo album is planned. Well, he was asked, are you planning anything for the 50th anniversary? And he said no. I didn't know if that he took that to mean if he's doing anything that day to honor it, because there has been talks about a, a remastered box set unless so, he's just trying to be evasive in case something should uh, fall apart it sounded like he's going to treat it like any other day okay but we will soon find out about that um but yeah i mean ringo is so comfortable doing country music as we all know and just uh from what he said about the one song that t-bone sent to him he called it old school I mean, I love old country. I wouldn't mind if he did something that was modern country, but he's so right at home with songs like, well, Don't Pass Me By is very, very country-esque, but songs like Crying, the song he did with uh, Willie Nelson. Are you too with the soundtrack to Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Because that... Uh, Some of it. Yeah, that would... I would imagine it's possible that's the kind of route they might go. Or... um... Um, I keep thinking of Robert Plant's album Angel Band, I think was a T-Bone Burnett production. But anyway. Okay, but it'll be interesting just to see the enthusiasm in Ringo that he keeps you know, being so active. It's fantastic. Um, as we've been hearing, the legendary Dolly Parton will have a new album coming out, which will feature an array of superstars, and it'll be called Rockstar. Months ago, we learned that Paul McCartney will be recording with her, and indeed he will. But that's not all. Ringo Starr will also be on the record together. They will be on the new version, Dolly's new version of Let It Be. And the cover version will have special guests Peter Frampton and Mick Fleetwood playing on it. It makes me wonder, with Mick Fleetwood there, does that mean Ringo's not going to drum? Maybe they're going to double drum. I don't know. We will find out when that comes out. The uh, The album is due out on November the 17th. Our brand new documentary is in the works on the life of uh, Beatles Apple's assistant, 
Chris O'Dell to be called Miss O'Dell, Sex, Love, Drugs, and Rock and Roll to be released later this year. George Harrison wrote the song Miss O'Dell, which honors her by name, and she also put out a, a book in 2009 on her career of the same name. She has a lot of history with the Beatles, was on the Apple rooftop when they gave their final performance, was Peter Asher's personal assistant at Apple, became good friends with several of the Beatles' wives, most especially Patty Boyd, and also worked for the Rolling Stones and Eric Clapton and Leon Russell. So that's something else to look forward to, this new documentary. Didn't you interview her on stage, Darren, at the fest a little while back? Yes. Okay. Yeah, last year. What was that, 2022? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a new TV series on Disney Plus called Muppet Mayhem. It's based on the Muppets' Dr. Teeth and the Electric Mayhem band. And in the seventh episode called Eight Days a Week, Peter Jackson appears in a parody of the documentary Get Back with a lot of Beatle references in the episode. And the band does a performance of All You Need Is Love. Special thanks to Scott O'Rourke for that information. A new tribute double CD is out honoring the late Pete Ham of Badfinger called Shine On, a tribute to Pete Ham on YNT Records. 35 tracks in total. Some of the artists involved in covering Pete's songs are Fernando Perdomo, who we know from that Ram On tribute for Paul and Linda's Ram album, which he worked on with Denny Sywell. Dennis Dyken of the Smithereens is covering, guess what song? Dennis. <laughs> The Bad Finger song. Uh, Reckless Eric is on there. Melanie. Ken Sharp is a part of this, known for being a writer for Beatle fan, also putting out his own solo records. And he also wrote that book, fantastic book, starting over on the Double Fantasy uh, sessions. Shine On uh, was just released, this new Pete Ham tribute last Friday. But Bad Finger fans, there's more. That same day, last Friday, a new Pete Ham release called Misunderstood came out. This is a digital-only release through DistroKid, and it's all demos that Pete made the last few years of his life. It's available on Amazon Music, Apple Music, and other streaming services, and there are auto-generated videos to hear the entire album on YouTube. Thanks to Tom Brennan, one of our listeners, for that information. I was just messaging with Dan Matavina. Uh huh. I hope that's how he pronounces his last name. Uh, about this. Matavina. Yep. Manta, about this uh, collection. Well, I, I just basically reached out and said, any any plans for physical format CD or something with it? And he seemed to be like, I'd love to do it, but not right now. Mm -hmm. You know, so just it's digital. digital only. Yeah. Okay. Well. Exciting news there for Badfinger fans. Two releases, all coming out last Friday. That's all the news we have this time out. And so we talk about this album right here. And the shirt that Darren's wearing. You outdid me. I don't have a living in the material world. No, shirt. really? <laughs> but I have my George Harrison shirt on right now. You know what we Collage both... of George. Ken and I both have living in the material world watches. And I was going to wear my watch today, too, but I haven't worn that in ages. <laughs> <clears throat> and I say it's my favorite album of all time. Jeez. <laughs> anyway, so um, some information about the album. It was released May 30th of 1973, recorded most of it October 1972 through March of 73. It uh, made number one on the Billboard album charts here in the United States for five weeks, also number one in Canada and Australia, number two in the UK. It was a great time, as I said earlier, 1973 for all the anniversaries. The Beatles' Blue Album, 1967 to 1970, hit number one on the Billboard album charts for one week. Red Rose Speedway dethroned it. It was number one for three weeks. And then George Harrison took Paul out of number one, with living in the material world so you had nine weeks in a row with a number one album between beatles and solo beatle albums the musicians on this album as always george always had stellar musicians ringo's on there jim keltner 
Nikki Hopkins, Gary Wright, Klaus Vorman, Jim Horn. And on Try Some, Buy Some, Leon Russell plays on it, as well as Jim Gordon and Pete Hamm. Um, 1972 uh, was a very busy year for George. Following the concert for Bangladesh, he was really kind of exhausted after all the work that he put into it. But in 1972, he spent some time writing this new material, promoting an album for Lon and Derek Van Eaton on Apple Records called Brother. He promoted Ravi Shankar's documentary called Raga. He also became more devoted to Hindu spirituality and Krishna consciousness at this time. He spoke very often about his friendship with Swami Prabhupada. That was an Indian guru who founded the Hare Krishna movement now, all the songs on Living in the Material World were brand new songs from 1971 and 72, with the exception of Try Some, Buy Some, which he wrote and recorded and produced uh, for Ronnie Spector as a single. But it was written around the time of All Things Must Pass, released as a single on Apple Records in 1971. He took the backing tracks for that, added his own lead vocals for the version that was on Living in the Material World. Um, August of 1972, the Concert for Bangladesh documentary film was released worldwide. And um, for this new album from George, Living in the Material World, he actually donated nine of the 11 songs, the publishing for that, plus the B-side of the single uh, Give Me Love, Miss Odell, to the Material World Charitable Foundation. And this was done because of tax problems that hindered his relief efforts for the Bangladeshi refugees, and he made sure there was a continuous stream of money uh, through ongoing publishing royalties to charities of his choice. Um, this album is one that I hold so dearly, and I'll tell you why in just a few moments. I have spoken about it upon occasion here on this show and my other podcast show, but let's start with talking with the two of you. Where does this album fall for you, Darren, when did you first hear Living in the Material World? Because I know you've talked about everything starting for you with Hey Jude, the album. And I think the first McCartney or Wings album was Red Rose Speedway. <clears throat> you had to, you know, pick and choose between group and solo music and when yeah, you chose I, I, to I, listen. I, I think about it all the time. What was it that, you know, at such a young age pulled me towards the Beatles? What well, in general, what was it, what made me such a music head? You know, what was it, you know, and, and like in any of us, all of us, anyone, someone who might collect comic books, what was it? What made that something that was going to be ingrained in you that you were going to be, uh, you know, an expert in collecting comic books? For me, it was music from as far back as four years old. And I wonder even if before that, um, and I don't know what drew me into it and at the same time pulled me towards the Beatles. And and Paul was my favorite Beatle, but still, I love them all. And I remember um, having, and I think this was just an accident, my Sweet Lord single, It Don't Come Easy, Power to the People, and Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey. So I had one single from the four of them. Um, Living in the Material World was one of the first George Harrison albums I owned. And it could very well have been the first one that really I listened to from beginning to end. Uh, and I don't, again, I don't know why I maybe asked for it as a birthday gift or something. Or, mm. or asked Santa Claus to bring me Living in the Material World. But I think I had it before All Things Must Pass. And I think it was before 33 and a third came out, which was the first current Harrison album that I got, that I got my hands on. Um, and I always like knowing the, knowing what copy of the album I have, I got an Apple. So it was close enough to the close of Apple in the mid seventies that they were still in stores. Mm. Uh, and the copy I got was an Apple. And I remember um, it was a, a little bit of a difficult album for me at that age, yeah, exactly. With that, you know, the brown paper in her sleeve. You know, those great la uh, la labels. Um, it was a difficult album for a 10 or 11 year old to totally understand. Right. But there were definite, like, 
living in the material world song and and of course give me love was it was a tune i loved back then um and trying to remember which were the tunes that appealed to me at the very beginning but even though some some of the melodies were a little difficult for me to kind of get into mm -hmm. i knew that there was something very magical going on with this record from a very young age and it was uh, only a matter of time before, as I got to know all of his records, by the time the 80s rolled around, it was, there was no question it was one of my favorites, you know, and it was a toss up between what, <laughs> it depended on what week it was. It was 33 and a third, or it was living in the material world, or all things must pass. I've waffled back and forth uh, with those. Uh, to me, living in the material world wasn't intended to be, but it was an extension of all things must pass that that very grandeur that that very grand spiritual release for George. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, once I had all things must pass, those two albums to me, kind of, they weren't related, but they very much were related in in, in what they said to me uh, as I was growing up and really devouring them, and back in the days when. You had a handful of records and you could listen to something and read the lyric sheet and play the side over again and go through it again and spend time right. with, a, with, a, with a brand new record. Uh, that's one of the drawbacks, if you could call it that, of doing what we do, working you know, with music, is that sometimes it becomes an assembly line. And you can't spend the time with a new record that you want to. It's got to hit you within one or two plays or it's going to always be, you know, not, it's never going to really get a chance to get what we've given these old classic albums like Living in the Material World. But I remember pouring over the, totally captivated by the packaging and pouring over the lyrics, trying to figure out, you know, what is he singing about and be here now. And, um, but uh, so, again, like many of these, I picked it up after the fact, uh, but it was one of, if not the first Harrison album I owned. And even from the beginning, though, I didn't totally get it. I knew something very special was going on in that album. I also think it's an absolutely gorgeous package. And mm -hmm. um, I've said this before about Harrison being the most consistent of the four Beatles when it comes to solo work. You could make the argument Harrison has not made a bum album. Um, maybe, maybe you might think extra, I do, I think extra textures, it's a little weak, but there's reasons why I think it's maybe a tired record, but it's got so many pluses on there that I'm always hesitant to dismiss it. But Harrison's albums were all for one reason or another outstanding. And I always enjoyed the packaging mm -hmm. of George's albums. They yeah. always looked great especially the Apple albums and especially living in the material world. Yeah. It's always a treat to see what they would do on the Apple label for each of the solo releases. But um, it's always fascinated me. You know, I've talked about this many times. If you grew up on the Beatles as a group and then you were exposed to the solo music as it came out, you might've been more critical of the solo music at the time. If you grew up on the solo music and you listened to that first, or if you listen to that with a mixture of the group, you may have a very different uh, impression of their catalog group and solo. But it interested me that you said that you heard this album before all things must pass, because I I'm sure I, there were. I think yeah. I did, or it was very close. Right. Again, what I remember, how I try to put things in a time, the Darren DeVivo timeline, uh, is by the copy, the edition of the album I, I bought. Right. And, I mean, if I got living in the material world in the mid-70s and mine was on Apple and had all of the, you know, the lyric card came in the brown paper sleeve with the Apple custom labels, uh, it had to be close to 75, 76. Uh, because it would have, so you know, it would have naturally sold out of the original pressings my old things must pass was on the orange capital label okay. so i know that all right that one at some point i picked that up maybe 76 77 perhaps the apple inventory was all cleaned out and it reverted to the capital label and and that's kind of how i place gee i must have had this close to this point in my life 
mm-hmm. which makes me think it may have been living in the material world first. Um, it also could have been, I'm 10, I'm 11. I got to ask mom for the money to buy these things. Right. All things must pass was probably like asking her to buy me a new bike, you know what I mean? Because it was a triple album. <laughs> so, um, and I don't remember getting it, but I must, maybe I got a good report card at some point. I avoided summer school one year and I got all things must pass as a gift, you know. Um, but living in the material world, I think I heard first. I believe I heard it first. Yeah. Not only was all things must pass a triple album, so was the concert for Bangladesh, <laughs> you know, two in a row like that. But uh, Alan, how about you? How do you remember first hearing living in the material world? And were you following, uh, you know, each solar release as it came out? And did you automatically make a comparison to All Things Must Pass? Um, Yeah, I probably did. Um, Don't really remember. Uh, I used to keep tabs on the solo albums, but didn't necessarily get them all at the time they came out. Um, I did get All Things Must Pass. Um, which I loved. And I went to the concert for Bangladesh. So I got that album as soon as it came out. Um, Living in the material world, I didn't get for a few years. Um, And I know, you know, I I spent a lot of time with it this week because I know it's your favorite album of all time. (laughs) And I want to, you know, be fair to it. I even listened to the surround version, which is out now. Um, And sounds sounds quite nice. (laughs) Um, but at the time it came out, I wasn't really crazy about it. I, I liked some of the songs. I liked Give Me Love. Um, and I probably more or less liked the title track. Um, and listening to it this week, I think I figured out why I was so resistant to the album as a whole. And that's because, um, okay, melodically, he has a lot going on. I mean, he has very arching melodies beyond anything he had done on um, All Things Must Pass. Um, and, and Bangladesh didn't have anything really new on it. So so All Things Must Pass really is the, the previous mm. batch of new songs. Um, it was a, a much more melodic than anything he'd done, but I didn't feel that his voice was really up to it. I mean, he sounds like he's straining a lot of the time. And he also, uh, there's something about his singing on this album that struck me. And I know I'm not alone as kind of whiny, you know? Um, You know, I feel that way about extra texture. Hmm. I know what you're saying. I don't hear it on this as much. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, his vocals on his Beatles things and his vocals on All Things Must Pass and Bangladesh didn't strike me that way, but this time it did. Um, so now I'm hmm. I'm able to sort of see past that. I mean, I, I, I still hear it and understand what it was I didn't like about it, but, um, you know, the songs themselves are great. And now I'm focusing more on that than on, let's say, the vocal performances. And as you said, Ken, there's a lot of great people on here. There's one you didn't mention, um, the tabla player, Zakir Hussein. Um, and I only notice it probably because, you know, there was that that other life I had reviewing classical concerts. And mm-hmm. we also used to review what they called world music concerts, meaning classical music from other cultures. And Zakir Hussein, I don't know if it was the case when this came out, but by the late eighties, early nineties, when I was doing concert reviewing and, and, you know, and, and beyond Zakir Hussein was a really big name as a tabla player. Um, In 1973, he might not have been, you know, it was, it was decades before all this. And, uh, you know, and, and it wasn't a name I recognized. I recognized Al Raka, you know, from Bangladesh and, and everything, but Zakir Hussein, I didn't. Um, but now that, you know, when I was looking over the weekend at the at the personnel list, I thought, wow, Zakir Hussein, how about that? Hmm. Okay. Um, Darren was talking about the packaging, so I thought, maybe, you know, we should show the, the whole thing. It's we gorgeous. Can, I mean, know. it has texture to it, too. Yeah. And here's you know, it's really 
And then it opened. And, you know, you've got this picture of, you know, George you know. At, at Friar Park with a set table full of people. Then uh, all the personnel and all that. That's supposed to be the Last Supper, I thought, always thought. That's a, that photo. The labels, I, I should. Right. Uh, this is one side. I should take it out of the thing. And then this is the other with that uh, Hindu art picture, which is also on the insert. Now, I've got the, you know, the, the last box set of it that came out, which comes with a really nice book, lots of illustrations, but this picture in here is kind of washed out. And I love these pictures. Um, you know, you you see a lot of um, illustrations of, uh, you know, the Bhagavad Gita sometimes come with illustrations like this. Uh, this had the lyrics inside. Mm -hmm. And then the... Om. Right, the Om. So I was saying to, to Ken before we started that um, this picture actually, for me is really the key to the whole album because this is what George is talking about. And it's, it's not as if you can't understand what he's talking about without understanding this, but he put this here for a reason, gave it a full album size, you know, piece of paper, um, cardboard. And uh, so, uh, you know, I thought it's, it's, it's worth just looking for a few minutes at what it is. Yeah. What this is, is, it's basically the opening scene of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, George talks about the Bhagavad Gita a lot in it talked in interviews. Here is the Bhagavad Gita. Um, this is a version that is a translation by a, gay, a guy named Juan Mascaro. And there's another Beatles connection because Juan Mascaro also did a translation of the Tao Te Ching, which by the way is where um, the words the inner light come from um i had said I Ching. it's Tao Te Ching. sorry um so this is the Juan mascaro version um okay so in this scene what happens in the bhagavad gita which is really you know it's 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 a thin book everyone should read it um it's part of a mammoth epic called the Mahabharata, which uh, I have, I have a copy of most of it. And it's like this thick, you know, wow. um, haven't, haven't ever finished it. Although there was this great Peter Brook staging of it that was on um, PBS years and years ago, worth, worth seeing if you can find it. Um, so in this scene, basically, uh, there are two armies about to go to war against each other. And the two armies are basically uh, one family, you know, the uh, two sons of a king, family split. Uh, Arjuna, who is this guy, is a prince, and he's the leader of one of the armies, okay? He is famous as an archer. And, oh, sorry, that's Krishna. This is Arjuna back here. And mm -hmm. you can see he's got arrows. He was an archer. That was his his main uh, weapon of choice, I guess. And uh, he asks Krishna to drive his chariot. And Krishna agrees. And they pull out into the center of the field between the two armies. And Arjuna says, look, Everyone around here on both sides, I see grandfathers and brothers and uncles and sons, and uh, I, I, I can't, I can't do this. And the rest of the Bhagavad Gita is Krishna explaining to him why he has to do it and the nature of duty. And basically, um, let me just read a, a couple of things. If any man thinks he slays, and if another thinks he is slain. Neither knows the ways of the truth. The eternal in man cannot kill. The eternal in man cannot die. He is never born. He never dies. He is in eternity. He is forevermore. Never born and eternal beyond times, 
gone or to come, he does not die when the body dies. When a man knows him as never born, everlasting, never changing, beyond all destruction, how can that man kill a man or cause another to kill? And, and then this is something that George has said a lot. As a man leaves an old garment and puts a new one on, the spirit leaves his mortal body and then puts on one that is new. Okay. And so what George is, is like what this whole album is about with the exception of maybe two cuts. Um, he's not saying, yeah, you should just go to war because it doesn't matter if you kill anybody because they're not dying and you're not going to die. What he's saying is the material world is meaningless. Um, the only thing that means anything is your internal spirit, which goes on. You know, you may think you're, you're dying, but you will just go inhabit a new body, you know, the, the Hindu concept of reincarnation. And, um, you know, and if you look at the lyrics and if you keep this in mind, it's sort of as if the whole album is about the Bhagavad Gita and what Krishna is telling Arjuna in there. And that's why he has, you know, this as you know, as big as it is in there, because it's kind of, to me at least, and and I think to George is the key to the whole album. Okay, um, so when you think of it in those terms, it's like this is an album that is sort of beyond what a pop album normally is, you know. And it seems to me that you know, thinking about that and you know, revisiting the bits of the Bhagavad Gita, you know, while I was listening to the album and and reading the lyrics and thinking about, you know, just what we know was important to George, it seemed to me maybe a little trivial to think that he sounds whiny or, or stretching. And, mm. you know, and so, cause you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find, you know, what it is that makes this Ken's favorite album of all time. You know, I don't know that I have a favorite album of all time because I have too many albums. <laughs> um, so it would be hard to, to, to pick one out but you know when you have when you know someone you know who you respect and they have an opinion you kind of want to know okay why why is that opinion what it is and um you know i i can't say ken will tell us whether the spiritual sides of this album have meant that much to him but when i consider the album it means a lot to me <laughs> And it means a lot to me that, you know, that it meant a lot to George. And he's trying to tell us this, you know, he could have been, he could have been going into his home studio, picking up his guitar and singing, you know, oh, baby, you're so cool. <laughs> but mm -hmm. he wasn't, he was singing, you know, be here now or the light that has lighted the world and, uh, you know, all of these, uh, you know, living in the material world itself, which also has, you know, another, there, there are two songs here that do something that I think he would have liked to have done in the Beatles. And that is integrate the Indian music more into rock than he was able to do. Like with, with the Beatles stuff, if he did an Indian thing, it was an Indian thing, you know, uh, yeah. living in the material world is a rock song and then you get to the middle eight and you hear the tabla and you hear the drone and it gets a little bit you know towards the indian style and then back into the rock thing and the same with be here now be here now fundamentally a rock song but if you look at the way the melody works and maybe why sometimes um i thought of it things as whiny is because it it picks up that indian melodic thing which is more modal than western music you know and in a way uh, a, a lot more nuanced and be here now has that in the melody even though it isn't an overtly indian sounding track the way you know within you without you is um hmm. so so basically yeah, you know, I mean, I don't think there's a bad song on here. I think even the the two songs that are totally outside the spiritual realm, which are Try Some, Buy Some and Sue Me, Sue You Blues, fit thematically into the idea of living in the material world. 
you know. Yeah, good point. Be... I, I think Try Some Buy Some has spirituality in it. You do? Yeah. Maybe. Uh, it, it, it's it, just, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I agree with Ken. I, there's, I don't, and don't ask me why. Off the top <laughs> of my head. But there is something about uh, where he goes with the lyrics in that song. Yeah. Let's have where he was not completely disconnected at that moment from anything spiritual. It was... It was in the back of his mind. It came through in those lyrics. It may not be as blatant as, as some of the other songs. And I think yeah. Ronnie Spector, kind of, Ronnie yeah. Spector even said she had no idea what she was singing. She didn't know what the song was all about. Yeah, that's a funny thing. I mean, I love her recording of "Try Some Buy Some," but it really didn't fit her style hmm. at all. I mean, George also was writing "You" at the same time during "All Things Must Pass," which he intended for Ronnie. That was more suitable, I think, for Ronnie Spector than try yeah. some buy some. But maybe it's very I think, maybe yeah. I th maybe I think of it as a non-spiritual song because I know it was a Ronnie Spector song <laughs> and figure that you know and, and and also the try some buys of the title, you know, makes it seems very materialistic. Mm -hmm. So try some buy some to me sounds like you know a lost and found kind of song where you're lost as a person, you're looking for meaning in life. It sounds like you're trying drugs. <laughs> mm. uh, recreational drugs and then i found you mm. you know then i found god um yeah. but all that you said there alan was very interesting in in that whole yeah. story there with the bhagavad gita because it explains why on many occasions george has always quoted he's been quoted as saying uh there never was a time when we didn't exist and there never will be a time when we cease to exist right and that's that's, exactly. that's the whole yeah philosophy right there i mean but, there's um there's this other other line um where arjuna is still a little confused and krishna says to him i've been, been i have been born many times arjuna and many times hast thou been born but i remember my past lives and thou hast forgotten thine so that's the difference between like, you know, us and Krishna, Krishna being a completely spiritual being, you know, really a, a Hindu God. Mm -hmm. um, although they have, you know, they have they have this whole hierarchy of gods. So Krishna isn't God in the way we think of God. The way we think of God, they have uh, Brahman, which is the, you know, complete spirit. You don't see pictures of Brahman the way you see pictures of Krishna. You know, so Krishna is like more like what we would think of as a demigod. But anyway, <laughs> we should start a religion podcast. <laughs> um, Sorry. <clears throat> question I have for you about all of this. What drew you to read the Bhagavad Gita? Was this something independent of anything having to do with George and the Beatles? Was it your interest in it drawn in by being exposed to like, I don't know, Indian classical music or just totally separate and it was just something you wanted to check out one day and um i would say it probably has entirely to do almost entirely to do with george you know okay. i wanted to know what it was that he was trying to tell us and he mentioned the bhagavad gita all the time and it seemed like a natural thing to pick it up and read it so i did but then also i mean i know i read it again <laughs> excuse me I know I read it again, um, like around 1990 when my father was dying and I knew that it had that aspect of, you know, nobody really dies, which, you know, is kind of a sort of comforting thing to read when, when this is going on. And, and so I read it again and listened to all things must pass again. And some of this album too. And, uh, you know, I'm not a Hindu, you know, I've got my own religion. But um, it's 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 just very interesting to me. It's it's a, it's a it's a book I, I really sort of came to love, um, and it really does have everything to do with George and George's music and what George's mm -hmm. music is about. Mm -hmm. it, it's like uh, it's like sort of a guide to to a lot of what George did for me. Yeah, I mean, for me, there's a lot of different sides of George Harrison. There's there's the very comical light side, the guy that does Cracker Box Palace and uh, got my mind set on you and this song, songs like those. And I love that side of him, too. But when he's really deep in his messaging, 
when he's saying something that really means a lot to him, that's what grabs me. I mean, I understood what he was trying to say with this album and that all the things in the material world don't really matter. We all search for, for money and fame and sex and drugs and rock and roll and all that. And here he is. I find it so fascinating to me that someone who was one of the foremost famous people on this earth who could have had anything he wanted wasn't happy with that. So he was searching for something else, the same way that we find John very, very fascinating as a person. Tried so many experiments, to, you know, for for happiness, you know, primal scream, various drugs, separation from Yoko, all these different things that John went through. And it's the same thing in a way with George. He discovered spirituality. Um, to me, what really touches me the most are the songs where he's talking about how he has changed. He's not the same person that you think he was. And I realize there are a lot of Beatle fans out there who are so consumed with the Beatles and fixated on the Beatles and will always think of these four guys as Beatles first without any other identity. But George Harrison is saying he's not the same person that he once was. And that's what the light that has lighted the world is all about. And he appreciates people that can see that, you know, and same thing with who can see it. They're very similar messages um, in the song. Um, who can see it? I'm just going to read some of the lyrics. I've been held up. I've been run down. I can see quite clearly now through those past years when I played towing the line. I only ask that what I feel should not be denied me now as it's been earned. And I have seen my life belongs to me. My love belongs to who can see it. So he's not just catering to his fans that want him to continue to be, you know, Beatle George all the time. This is the new George. He's come to accept it. And he's telling his fans about this. And it, to me, is a very bold, daring move on his part. It's no different to me than John Lennon saying, I don't believe in Beatles in yeah, God. Point. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. John revealed so much of himself. Well, throughout so much of his music, but Plastic Auto Band was such a, a bare album and so revealing about what he was going through. And for a lot of people, it was tough to take in. It was harrowing, you know, but John is bearing his soul there on that album. And in so many ways, I feel like George is doing this on Living in the Material World. You know, even the songs like Don't Let Me Wait Too Long, George has this incredible knack for writing songs that you can interpret as being for another woman <laughs> or it could be for God. Right. Mm -hmm. Don't Let Me Wait Too Long is one of those songs. You know, Give Me Love. You know, it could easily be about another woman or it could be, you know, a message to God. He has, it's it's such a, a you know, it's a brilliant thing to be able to pull that off that you can interpret a song two completely different ways and i always love don't let me wait too long as a commercial song and i always said it should have been the second single it could have been a big hit i felt but overall when he's doing songs like the light that has lighted the world or who can see it and be here now which to me is so overpowering as a song i looked at it as being like a mantra because it's um one of those songs where lyrically less is more there's only a few words you know in the lyrics of that entire song and he drags them out throughout the whole song each word takes up a measure or two measures and when you're doing that you're making a point here with what you're saying all about living in the now living in the present not being stuck in the past and um you know i i um I feel very influenced by this album, by what George is saying there, not necessarily following the whole story of what you just said with the Bhagavad Gita, Alan, but just realizing there are other purposes in life than what we've been brought up, you know, in this material world to strive for. Some people are not happy unless they have a lot of money or a lot of material possessions. And I also found it fascinating that here is George saying these things and he lives in this mansion. <laughs> And right in the front, they're having this big banquet, you know, in that picture. So a lot of people kind of saw some hypocrisy in that. 
But apart from that, um, that is all I think is one of the greatest love songs ever written. Um, I wish that it was as well known as as My Sweet Lord or Give Me Love. It is of the quality, I feel, of a song like something, just that it's not as well known. I wish more people would cover it. It's a gorgeous melody. You were just saying before, Alan, that there are, um, what was the word, soaring melodies uh, on the album. And being a melody guy, I appreciate that. <laughs> One of the many reasons why I love the Beatles so much is because you have three of the greatest melodic songwriters. You listen to a song like that is all melodically. It's absolutely gorgeous. You know, who can see it as a gorgeous song melodically? Um so Andy I love the Williams me- covered it. Andy Williams, Harry Nilsson covered it. That's right. Um, but I mean, the mere fact that Andy Williams did it, someone of that caliber, someone of, you know, in that Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, great singers in, in that field, if someone like that recognizes a song like that as all, there's got to be something to it. Um, I love The Day the World Gets Round. I mean, that was a song that George wrote right after the concert for Bangladesh because he was really upset that uh, he he said in his own words, why is it that pop stars have to raise money to help countries out when politicians should be basically doing all of it because they have enough money in the world where they can take care of all the world's problems twice over? You know, why should it be left to pop stars to do that? And he also had problems with money not being sent to Bangladesh after that concert. So here his heart was in the right place. And then, you know, he had to um, go through these problems right after that concert where the money went. So um, Sumi Say You Blues, I like a lot. I love the slide guitar work throughout this entire album, by the way. But, you know, there's always that side of George that's also kind of cynical and kind of funny at the same time. Um, what's the line? Um, Sign in on the dotted line um, on Sumi CU Blues, where all that's left is to find yourself a new band. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's affidavit uh, swearing affidavit time. Affidavit swearing sign- time, yeah. Yeah, sign in on the dotted line. Um, hold the Bible in your hand, but all that's left is to find yourself a new band. Just reflecting on the the lawsuit that Paul had on the other Beatles there. Um, Living in the Material World is a great rock song. And also, you know, I do have very specific memories tied into listening to the radio. We've talked, Darren, you and me, about WPLJ, which was the number (laughs) one rock station in New York City. I can tell you what songs were played on that station as all these solo albums came out. And yeah, they played Give Me Love, but I also remember hearing Sue Me, Sue You Blues. They played uh, Don't Let Me Wait Too Long. They played Living in the Material World. They played The Lord Loves the One. You know, they played a lot of tracks from this album. You just um, heard something in saying that. And it must have been WPLJ, whether or not it was 73 or not. No, it wouldn't have been 73, but it would have been a couple of years later. I remember, and it had to be PLJ, because I remember hearing that on the radio a lot. Mm -hmm. And I wonder now if that was, I liked the song, and it was like, okay, that'll be the George Harrison album I'm going to get. You'd kind of spurred that thought in my head by mentioning that, because I remember, I used to think it was a hit. You know, we've talked about mm. having, having the perception of it being a hit. We would hear it so much on the radio. But uh, anyway, didn't mean to ru- interrupt. No, that. that's kind of fine. Like the light bulb went off there when you mentioned that. Yeah. I mean, if, because 19, 1973 hit me like a ton of bricks. I've often said what a, it's the greatest year in the solo careers of the Beatles. Yeah. Um, and when you think about all the music that came out of the four of them that year, and I loved all the other music that came out of that year. um, I remember that year, like it was yesterday. I remember hearing everything on the radio in my bedroom before going to school. You know, I know that WPLJ played half the album Mm -hmm. and um, the public responded by making it a number one album. And um, 
See, the thing is, prior to that, I had gotten the solo Beatle albums, but I don't think I would have gotten it the day of the release. It might have been a month later or even half a year later. I don't quite recall. But 1973, everything just came together that year. And I do know that as the solo albums came out that year, I bought them as soon as they came out. And living in the material world wasn't just a part of my youth. It's an album that I listen to constantly over and over again. I never get tired of it. And what surprises me most uh, is that, like I said, I'm very much a melody person. I, you know, I, I can enjoy a song with a great melody that has average lyrics and prefer that over a song that has great lyrics, but no melody, mm. you know? And, um, but George's music, so much of it melodically is so strong. And he also has a style that's all his own, especially with all the, the odd chords that he puts into his music. He's known so much for his diminished chords. Um, and the messages that he's bringing us on this album were just so deeply personal. And it really hit me very hard. And I think it took a lot of guts for him to say the things that he said there knowing full well that there are still Beatle fans out there that will always think of him as a Beatle first mm -hmm. and, and not recognize this side to him, which was so important. And he carried it with him till he died. Mm. You know? Um, it's a great thing to have variety in the music. I'm all for variety. And I love, like I said, the different sides of George Harrison. But the side that I love the most is when he really is spiritual and he says things that mean a lot to him, regardless of how we feel, because it tells you more about him than anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, he could write a pop song and, you know, try to have a top 40 hit or a top 10 hit. And he certainly managed to have a number one hit with Give Me Love. Um, he could do those songs, but the ones that grab me the most are the ones that lyrically say so much about him. There's also yeah. a, another bit of um, humorous Beatlesness in here, um, in in the title track. Um, met them all here in the material world, John mm. and Paul here in the material world. Though we started out quite poor, we got Richie on a tour, got caught up in the material world. So it even even includes a pun on, you know, we started out quite poor, got Richie, Richie, i.e. Ringo on a tour, mm -hmm. but also Rich. Uh, got caught up in the material world it, it's kind of funny because his his history of the beatles is okay we got all together and then we got caught up in the material world <laughs> which to him is nothing you know right it's kind mm. of interesting you know this album i find it fascinating what both of you had to say um because it was like almost like an education for me um uh, hearing these different viewpoints on the album I've always looked at it as being an album that unfortunately, you know, it wasn't necessarily universally re regarded when it came out. There were some critics who weren't interested in the preachiness of it and the overly spirit, the, the overt spirituality on it. And that was a turnoff for some. And it's a shame because this album, maybe more than any album is George Harrison. All you need to do, like kind of what you were saying, Ken, all you need to do is listen to Living in the Material World. That's George Harris. And if you look at maybe put the spiritual spiritual stuff to the side, you look at the music, as Alan pointed out, the melodic, it's such a melodic album. Uh, this is the example where, this is the point where it's right here. Harrison was on par with Lennon and McCartney as songwriters. And it really makes you wonder, gee, what would happen if Paul and John and George were all equals in 1959-60, <laughs> where it wouldn't have been kind of John and Paul riding together and George was just a guitar player trying then to get her be heard. Because man did Harrison erupt as an Italian, uh, as a talent, as an Italian <laughs> let's say he's an italian where the heck did that come from as a talent uh and then you listen to living in the material world and it has it's got it all it's it's it puts him on their level in my opinion uh and i hope people re listen to it today with that i don't think they will but listen to it with that 
thought in mind that, you know, this was a phenomenon, this whole Beatles thing, to have three talents like that when it came to songwriting alone. And if you need proof, listen to Living in the Material World. That's all you need to listen to. I mean, it was just an extraordinary album. And it's a shame, though, that certain aspects of the material world kind of maybe turned George off after Living in the Material World came out. The album was released because he, he did get caught up in all of that stuff uh, with after Bangladesh with the funding. And that, that was also a delay if I'm not mistaken, on why Living in the Material World didn't come out right away. He was caught up in all of the red tape uh, with the money that the concert and the album and the movie uh, was supposed to raise and did raise, but now wasn't getting, the money wasn't getting where it needed to be. Right. Then perhaps some of the negative reviews that were there for the preachiness of Living in the Material World and, oh, he goes out on tour a year later, a year and change later, and his voice is shot. And boy, what an embarrassment the tour was. And Dark Horse wasn't as strong of an album. And it, it was like, you know what? I don't need this. You know, George felt that one. Hmm. I don't need this. And um, it's a shame because I think maybe it might have affected where George went. That feeling that he was trying to present something and it wasn't being heard, his message. It wasn't being paid attention to. So I don't need this aggravation. You know, I don't know if you guys agree with me, but. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And he would then do things like maybe mail it in a bit with extra texture. Plus it was a, a, a coming out on a dead label that it wasn't going to get, you know, the attention that it deserved. And maybe he felt that same way. In fact, I'm pretty sure he felt that same way. The, 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 experience of having warner brothers breaking his you know what's with somewhere in england that he has gone troppo whatever you know what i mean and his whatever is like this is a great album well you can tell that there, there are moments in george's career where he really cares about whether yeah. or not his record does well and there, and there are times when if it does moderately well fine yeah. You know, when 33 and a third came out, he pushed it a little bit, you know, and made the videos, went on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Cloud Nine promoted the hell out of Cloud Nine, you know? So there are those moments in his career. He promoted the Traveling Wilburys a lot. Didn't really need much promotion when you've got so yeah. many superstars in one band like that. But there were times when I think it didn't matter as much to him. He didn't want to have to be, uh, you know, as popular as Michael Jackson became or Fleetwood Mac right, at the time. Right. I think he probably felt that through all things must pass, he proved himself at that yeah, point. And I think, and I think that then he was frustrated by the fact that there was still some hesitation on his message. He was still getting um, kind of pushed back a little bit. It may not have mattered as much to him, but it angered him that what he was putting forth wasn't people weren't interested or weren't getting it or weren't paying attention. So why bother? I didn't want it in the first place. I didn't want this thing in the first place. Hmm. I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Do you think that this album is appreciated more now? Because no matter what, I mean, I see over the years, the trends, of uh, certain albums from George. I certainly see more appreciation for 33 and a third in George Harrison as albums. And everybody loves All Things Must Pass and Cloud Nine. And I've seen a lot of, you know, um, great things being said about Brainwashed. But sometimes that middle period of the 70s, I think possibly because it followed All Things Must Pass. And how could you top All Things Must Pass? You know? Maybe the album suffered a bit in the eyes of a lot of people because, you know, All Things Must Pass isn't just one great album. It's two great albums of material. Right. And it shocked the whole world that George had it in him. Not that he wasn't capable because he was proven towards the end of the Beatles. He was writing amazing material. What are they saying now about Abbey Road? Something in Here Comes the Sun are two of the best songs. Yeah. But to have so much great stuff all at once on All Things Must Pass... I sometimes wonder if he had 
two single albums <laughs> of all things was passive that material spread out over a year or two you know how different we might look at those two albums now but to put them out together with apple jam mm -hmm. whether or not that's relevant i mean it blew everybody away with all things must pass i think in many ways living in the material world matched all things must pass but maybe was a little harder to penetrate because it was so spiritual and some people weren't interested in that or couldn't understand it. Like with me, I knew, like I said at the beginning, I knew there was something very special going on in the album. I didn't totally understand it. I was too young. I didn't totally get it. Uh, in fact, it was probably completely different language. You know, I grew up, you know, an Italian American kid in the Bronx going to Catholic grammar school, Catholic high school. So I had that, you know, hammered over my head at that age that that's it. Here you go. Mm. Read these three chapters of this book in the Bible, write a summary, hand it in, and you'll get a grade. Um, so things like what George was singing about, I probably had no clue. Mm -hmm. But still, I could tell there's something very heavy going on in here, and it would right. take time. And then when the pieces started to fall together in place, it didn't happen quickly. I realized this is brilliant. This is actually a brilliant album. Um, and unfortunately, it's too many years later, just too many millions of records and songs out there for all of a sudden music lovers to go back X number of years and concentrate on reassessing living in the material world. So it kind of got lost. You mentioned about it being appreciated today. Amongst Beatle fans and George Harrison fans, yes. Uh, I do think that, though. When somebody dies, and I don't mean just to sound, you know, cold, you get martyred. So when George died, a lot of people ran and re-listened, rediscovered. Maybe some people listened for the first time and discovered and found something very likable and agreeable in George that they were not paying any attention to. Okay, and, and, and in a way, the same thing happened with John. There's been this, almost this whole thing of like, John could do no wrong uh, line of thinking when you put John Paul together. Many times through the years, I've had that whole McCartney, you know, Lennon was the guy. And I'm like, well, mm. no, they were the guys. They could be perfect match. They could be oil and water. And that's why the two of them just complemented each other perfectly. You mm -hmm. can't just brush off, you know, a McCartney because John sang Give Peace a Chance to put a army helmet on in a video. Um, so there is that aspect of, of, of once you die, um, you become, you know, more, maybe more of a, a hero than you were when you were alive. And I think that happened with George, but in this case, it's good because people paid attention to the records and you will hear people, friend, people we know, friends, Beatle fans who will, who will speak highly of a gone tropo. And I don't have to post on Facebook about gone tropo and then explain myself. Well, you know, two thirds of the people reading my posts know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. maybe they don't like it as their favorite album or the best but they get it they know what it's all about i think before george passed unfortunately you know people didn't pay as close attention that goes for any artist musician personality whatever oh there's there's so many artists we could go through here that i only know a handful of their songs and they pass away and then i'm curious yeah you go back What's, and then yeah. you opinion could change right and i think it with george people realize what they missed out a passive beetle fan maybe or um or didn't it never occurred to them what george brought to the table they were now like oh you know what i mean he was on you know it took me 30 years but i hear it now i get it you know you, you can never stop learning and and there are so many fans that I that I come across in these two podcasts who will tell me I didn't understand what George was saying all those years ago, all those years ago, and now I'm getting it. Yeah, you know. So, 
Alan, how do you feel about this? Do you think in any way that the perception of living in the material world may have suffered because it followed as a studio album, All Things Must Pass? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. All Things Must Pass, you know, everyone just was knocked out by and living in the material world, there was some people could take it or leave it, uh, and including me at the time. Um, you know, like I said, I didn't go get it as soon as it came out. I got it years later. And, um, but you know, now I don't listen to the radio a lot because, um, well, partly because I'm writing all day and I can't, uh, but also I have a lot of records. Hmm. Um, you don't listen to the radio a lot. Um, I'm kidding. Sorry, guys. Ex except our shows. Except but our I shows. <laughs> But I listen, you know, when I'm out, when I'm out, when I'm in the car or when I'm even, you know, shopping, you know, they'll have things on. And I hear uh, Give Me Love on the radio um, pretty frequently when I'm, you know, not when I'm when I'm driving. I'm often listening to Sirius XM's Beatles channels. So, mm. um, you know, that's going to play Beatles stuff. But if I'm just in the supermarket and Give Me Love comes on or another day. You know, um, mm. some of these early solo Beatles tracks and, and they're just sort of in the rotation in whatever the grocery store is playing. I, I'm sort of impressed by that because, you know, I, I kind of think these in in a way, this is a, a, a distant era that only, uh, you know, the three of us and our listeners care about. So, mm. I, so I, I love hearing it when I'm, you know, in, in the store. And, and I heard Give Me Love just uh, um, like last week you know, when I was shopping. So, um, so some of this album has a life of its own. Um, I think you run into living in the material world, the title track every now and then too. Um, I, I think more of it deserves to be revisited. Um, and I think, you know, for our listeners out there, if you've, if you've written off this album because it's preachy or it sounds whiny or whatever it is, you know, Give it another spin and, and uh, you know, and read the lyrics while you're doing it and listen closely. It's um, it's it's kind of maybe a, a hidden find that may be sitting right in your record collection waiting for you to rediscover. Mm. Give it many spins, I okay. should say. Yeah. And if, but, you, if you say if you're a George Harrison fan, if you are really a George Harrison fan, it can still be dismissive about living in the material world. I question whether you really get it. I mean, that kind of, I've started a fight, I know, with some people, I'm sure. I'm sure I've started a fight, but really, I mean, if you could be dismissive of living in the material world, then I don't think you totally get, get George Harrison. Right. There was one other thing I wanted to bring up, and you know that when we've talked about all things must pass or even let it be, I'm certainly I have no problem with Phil Spector's production and I love the production on all things must pass. Yeah. But I also think that some fans who don't really care for the wall of sound or think that Phil Spector overproduced an album like all things must pass living in the material world is simpler production without the wall of sound, with the exception of try some buy some, which was co-produced by Phil Spector. And I think in some ways, the songs where George is saying a lot, the ones that I mentioned in particular, The Light That Is Light of the World, Who Can See It, Be Here Now, um, those kind of benefit because the message is heard more. It's not in any way, there's no chance of it being buried in production. It's simpler production. And the message comes across even more clear, I think, in that way. I think it benefits from less production on songs like those. When you're caring more about the lyrics well, of course, the melody is great and the whole arrangement's great. But if you're caring about what you're saying, sometimes when you have less production, you can listen to it more and really get what the message is than what George is saying here. So I guess that's another reason why I love the album so much. All right. Anything else you guys want to add? No, I think we did a nice job talking about the great record. And um, that is uh, on par with the best of what the four of them did together and apart. Seriously, believe that. Hey, there's no argument from me there, Darren. Yeah. <laughs>
there's a lot of solo albums that I would I would uh, equate with the best Beatles albums too, mm -hmm. but uh, definitely this one I rank way up there. So why don't we tell all the folks uh, what we're doing? We'll start with you, Darren. Okay. Right now I'm sitting here talking on the computer. Ha! -ha. No. Um, I'm at WFUV, which you know, and Alan doesn't listen, but um, we're at, I'm kidding, Alan. I'm just teasing. 90.7 FM in the New York City metro area. Uh, and there are little little points in the metro area of New York City where you will have trouble picking us up. It has to do with antennas and radios and signals traveling through buildings and canyons and uphill and downhill and um, uphill <laughs> shots and downhill shots. and Throwing honeymooners yeah. lines in uh, there. So we have two other ways you could listen wfuv.org or get our app and listen there and uh, you could uh, check out fuv we play a lot of new music uh you, if you enjoy i hope you do uh enjoy what you know i do here with alan and ken if you put on that fuv you'll see like a completely different world um as we play so many new artists and new sounds out there and we play give me love give me peace on earth um and we play um, Don't Let Me Wait Too Long, which will pop up so often. But anyway, 90.7 FM, Monday night to Thursday nights, 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Uh, I'm on the air. And Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4. And uh, look for me on Facebook. I have two Facebook pages, Darren DeVivo and the other one with a more involved title. Um, and like me, follow, and we'll be in touch that way. And, and we will see them there. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, if they can make money from the people who wrote the scripts for the Honeymooners, how much you take from them? <laughs> and I do catch Darren on the radio all the time in my car. If I know you're on. Are you driving around that late at night during the week? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I hear you mix a lot of classic stuff with the new stuff. I learned from you, Darren. Which well, is it is in a way, own. if you're not familiar, I mean, I'm still learning. Yeah, you no. Know, I would would say some of the new artists and the new music that's out there. Hmm. But still finding out, I'm like, who the heck is this? And I'll have to go do a little research. I'm like, oh, where was I? This is his sixth album, you know. And it's, uh, or he's been worked with this guy, that guy, and the other guy. Hmm. Uh, it's a good education then to take it and combine it with the, with the you know the stuff from the past. Anyway, I'll shut up now. That's all right. The WFUV is a station that I listen to on a fairly regular basis, but always in the car. Okay. Alan, how about you? Um, yeah. Um, I just have one little footnote. I mentioned Juan Mascaro, the um, translator mm -hmm. of this version of Bhagavad Gita, and mentioned his Tao Te Ching, but I neglected to mention the reason I brought him up in the first place um, is that in uh, I Me Mine, I think George reproduces a letter that he wrote to Juan Mascaro after Juan Mascaro sent him his translation of Tao Te Ching. So there actually is a direct Beatles connection, George Harrison connection between this guy and you know and George. So Very just good. wanted to, uh, to sort of tie that up because I neglected to finish saying why. I would imagine there's other translations though out there, yeah. right? Oh, there are tons. And yeah. you would recommend for the novice like me? If I, I want the one like I kind of like this one. This is a, a penguin classic. Uh, <laughs> I have um I have actually quite a bunch of them. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, another another thing about the Bhagavad Gita I neglected to mention was that um Philip Glass's second opera, which is called Satyagraha, um, which was uh, Gandhi's uh, principle of peaceful resistance. Um, the opera is about Gandhi, but the entire text of the opera is from the Bhagavad Gita. Interesting, interesting, interesting okay. thing. So it, it keeps coming into my life in various ways, <laughs> uh, but principally through George. Anyway, so you can um, get in touch with me um, at Facebook, um, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, you can contact all of us at our joint email, which is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. That's things we said today radio show at gmail.com. Such an immense name. 
Um, you can follow us on Twitter at, at things we said fab. And um, yeah, and we have uh, two Facebook pages. <laughs> Uh, let's see, things we said today and things we said today, Beatles radio fans. Darren. Yeah. Make a new page for us. I'm, I'm telling you, <laughs> coming. I'm at the begin. I have started preliminary work uh, on it. Um, it doesn't work. I have a weird filter on. I'm just realizing this. There's a filter on my, because um, I used Zoom for something else one day and I, I think I was attempting to disappear like green screen in the middle of a meeting. So that's why I'm all funky looking here. Thank you, Alan, because that's not working here. Oh, there's no way. This is the logo. This is our logo now, folks. And you will be seeing this on the Facebook page. I had a temper tantrum late last week uh, with Facebook and trying to set something up, and I could not figure it out. Uh, it is not a user-friendly thing. I've always said this, Facebook. And I was trying with this page to do something that was simple and I couldn't. So I had a little temper tantrum, but I'm over it now and I'll get back to work. But what I'm talking about is we're going to have a new page eventually do away with the two old ones. It'll be, I did the new one will be identified by our logo. Uh, and we will see them there. So, and so, <laughs> so you're overdoing it with the honeymoon. I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. Go ahead, Ken. You're on the air. Honeymooners podcast. <laughs> All right. If you would like to get in touch with me, especially if you love living in the material world, you can email me at everylittlething at att.net. Uh, my YouTube channel, I just did a show a few days ago, a really intense show. Since tomorrow, May 24th, is actually going to be Bob Dylan's 82nd birthday. Right. I did what will be part one. Uh, of a conversation with Jeff Slate, New York musician, oh. um, and also a rock journalist uh, who interviewed Bob Dylan, um, actually, last year for his new book, um, and Dylan Seavey, who's a Nashville musician, uh, guitar player and drummer, massive Dylan fan, and Andy Nichols, who is one half of the Two Legs Paul McCartney podcast, also a huge Dylan fan. And it's all about the Beatles and Bob Dylan, their relationships with each other, how one influenced the other, um, and going through the whole history of it all. We we ended at the concert for Bangladesh. We're going to pick up in a few weeks up to the present. So if you're a big Bob Dylan fan, and by the way, you should know that Darren here named his son Dylan, Dylan Harrison, yeah, yeah. Should, it should have been Harrison Dylan, though. But you know, I'm well, not. I mean, it was about my that. wife liked. To, I don't want to get into the whole story. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, Dylan is was more my wife, more Dylan Thomas. Okay, Harrison, whoever was, he was. What? Whoever he was. Uh, he <laughs> Thomas used to pitch for the old Washington Senators. No, I'm kidding. Um, but there's also um, a funky effect there on my finger. Um, Harrison, I always wanted a Beatle connection in the name. And then it was literally, I think the day after he was born, I was driving to the hospital, had all things must pass on, uh, cause it was February. My son was born right on February 22nd, mm -hmm. right before Harrison's, uh, uh, and he, had, and George had, no, he was still alive, George, uh, but he, we knew he wasn't well. Um, and I had all things must pass on tape in the car. And the light bulb went off when listening to um, help me here. I'd have you anytime. Thank you. Uh, and I went up to, I remember going up to the hospital room and I got there and I went, Dylan Harrison, you get the Welsh connection, hon. My wife, like Dylan Thomas and Harrison, the Beatle connection, songwriting credit, bingo. All right. Well, I'm proud of you for combining the two. That's my story. You didn't get my little in joke there, did you? No, Dylan, I didn't. What Dylan is... Thomas, whoever he was. Well, Simon. No, that one went. Yeah. <laughs> Simon and Garfunkel. Oh, okay. It's on uh, a simple, desultory. Yes. Olympic. Yeah. Oh, yes. Dylan, yes. Yes. Dylan Don't Thomas, whoever no. he was, the man ain't got no culture. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm off my meds now. Don't mind me right now. Okay. 
All right. So uh, that's one show there on my YouTube channel, The Beatles and Bob Dylan. Ken Michaels Radio. Check it out. I also just did another show with Madeline Baccaro, the author of this book on Yoko Ono, In Your Mind, The Infinite Universe of Yoko Ono, all about Yoko Ono's premonitions. Uh, certain things that she predicted might happen or things that were in her lyrics ended up happening later on or in her mm. artwork. A real cool thing. There's a whole chapter on that in her book. Wow. Again, that's Ken Michaels Radio. Every little thing, my radio show, my syndicated radio show, if you'd like to hear it on demand, you can go to WFDU's website, WFDU.FM. Go to their archival shows, type in every little thing. It will have the last two week shows on there. And each show lasts on their website for two weeks. And my other uh, podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. We just did a show last week with an interesting topic. With the Beatles was the sum greater than the parts. We have a nice, healthy debate on that. You might want to check out. And we'll be doing a show on June the 5th, Monday night. It's a live broadcast. Monday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Time at Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast on our YouTube channel. It's going to be on this baby living in the material world. So we can hear what my other co-hosts have to say about this album my all-time favorite this you is, like that album i love this album then no one should be confused this is not invisible touch by the way this is george harrison's living <laughs> in the material world it's very handy <laughs> <laughs> look what so, i've started folks they're getting the nutty they're getting nutty now mm. so i believe that's everything oh by the way Mentioned Bob Dylan's birthday. Olivia Harrison celebrated her 75th birthday last Friday. Happy birthday to you, Olivia. Happy birthday. Okay. So right. thank you, Alan. Thank you, Darren. Thanks to all of you for watching. And thank you, George, for this amazing album, Living in the Material World. And um, until next time, I'm Ken Michaels saying, be here now. <laughs>